Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's all stand. As always, it's always good to just lift your hands. Let's ask the Lord to bless this service today. Let's ask him to be here in a mighty way. Lord Jesus, we praise you, God. We magnify you, Lord. Lord, we ask that you'll bless this service today, Jesus. Touch every heart, touch every soul, touch every saint that's here. Bless and anoint them, O God. We give you the praise. We give you all the honor today, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed be your name, O God. We praise and we will glorify you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. From the bottom of my heart to the depths of my Lift your hands. You, Tell him all I love you. I love, I love you, you, Jesus. I praise you, God. I we magnify you, you, Jesus. Love you, we love you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Lord Jesus. Oh, Thank mighty you, Jesus. God, mighty God, mighty Thank God. You, God. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I feel like something good is about.
can you feel it? I feel it in my feet. Oh, I can feel it. I feel it in my heart. Oh, Lord, I feel it all. something good is about to happen why don't you just rejoice for a little bit right now and magnify the Lord we praise and we exalt you Jesus hallelujah hallelujah I'm thankful for you Jesus I'm thankful for your love I'm thankful for your grace I'm thankful for your healing power hallelujah Jesus blessed be your name hallelujah Jesus Blessed Lord, blessed Lord. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a hand praise today. Boy, y'all let me down. I said, let's give the Lord a hand praise today. Let's magnify him just for a moment. It's all right to clap your hands. It's all right to worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. If society's teaching us anything today, they're teaching us it's all right to just be mediocre. Amen. It's all right just to be mediocre. You don't have to put anything extra into it because you're going to get a trophy no matter what. Amen? Amen? Why do we want to be mediocre in the presence of God? This is your opportunity today. On March 21st, you stepped into the house of the Lord. All you got to do is just not be mediocre. Just exalt him from the bottom of your heart and give him praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We magnify you, Jesus. I exalt you today, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. hallelujah. Blessed be your name. The old time preachers say all the time, I didn't come here to play patty cake for Jesus. There's too many important things going on in my life to come here and play patty cake for Jesus. I don't know about you, but I seem like I got a lot of issues, whether they're mine personally or they're just involved with me. But I got a lot of them. And I can't just play patty cake. I just can't come in here and be complacent. I just can't come in here and be mediocre. But I want to exalt him. 
I want him to know that there's someone down here in Ravenswood, West Virginia. Oh, he's getting my attention. Oh, he's giving me some praise. I want him to know that I'm alive and well, and I acknowledge he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords today. Hallelujah. Jesus. I can promise you if you get his attention, you're getting every demon in hell's attention as well. Just by saying the name Jesus, you've called them all to an attention. That's the kind of power you have just by one word say coming out of your mouth. Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord another hand praise again today. Glory. Devil. 
Hallelujah. Let's just keep this atmosphere going. Let's keep praising him. Let's keep pushing forward. Hallelujah, Jesus. Yes, mighty God. We thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you can't praise him for yourself, start praising him for the other saints in this church. Hallelujah, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. We magnify you, God. We magnify you, Jesus. Let's lift our hands one more time and let's just keep loving him again. Oh, Lord Jesus, we praise you. We praise you. We magnify you, Jesus. Lord, let your spirit roll. Let your spirit flow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord another hand praise again today. Hallelujah. Praise God. I don't know about you, but it makes my heart proud to see my pastor down there praising and worshiping God like he's a 25-year-old. Amen. Hallelujah. Brother Johnston is just like me and some others. He wasn't raised in this thing. If you come from the world outside and you just meet him, well, you're going to think this, this man, he's been holy and he's been gracious and he's been this way all his life because you would never know otherwise. But I'm here to submit to you today that wasn't always the case with our pastor. He's just like every one of you and myself. If it wasn't for the Lord... Where would he be today? Brother Johnson, would you care to speculate? So there's no harm. There's no shame. And to lift in your hands and worship in the Lord with all your heart and might. Outside of receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, 
I remember when we were in the old sanctuary. And I've told this story, and I'm going to tell it until I die. So bear with me. I was arrogant, prideful. Thought I was better than most. Not because I was taught that way, because I felt like I outworked everybody. I had to work on the farm like a man when I was five years old. And everything I did, I earned it. It wasn't given to me. So when I walked into anywhere I went, I didn't expect nothing from nobody. I got mine because I earned it. I'm just giving you a little bit of history here. It wasn't because I was raised like that by my parents. I just felt like that I could get whatever I wanted to do. Because if I set my mind to it, I knew I could work to get it. And then I went to an apostolic church. Wow. Sister, you remember. All of a sudden, I walked into a presence of God. Not like I'd ever been before. You know why? The very first impression I had in Apostolic Church was what, Brother Johnston? It was the worship service. It was the very first impression I had. Amen? That, that's what set the tone for me. That was my first experience. Sister Sauters up there playing. Brother Atkins, Brother Zim, Brother Gary Hughes. Those are my early experiences. And I found out that I'm not the man that I thought I was. Because this man was so prideful, you're not going to make me lift my hands. Come make me. That was my attitude. I'm not raising my hands to nobody. If I want to raise my hand, miss you, tell me to raise my hand. <laughs> That's why I was at church to begin with. Pettis said, if you want to see here on Sundays, you had to come to church. So I came to church. All my pride and everything. Amen? I'm just being honest. It didn't happen the first service. It didn't happen the second service. I don't know when it happened. I remember Sister Caressa. Now, that woman scared me. And she knows it too. She still uses it against me. But when the presence of the Lord fell upon her, it didn't matter who was around her. It didn't matter at all. She was going to worship God and she was going to move the pews. Literally move the pews. I'm being serious. She moved the pews. And here I am, here I am, this prideful man, watching a woman move the pews and thinking, whoa, I don't want to mess with her. But there had to be something there. And, and service after service has started accumulating, Brother Johnston. It started with a little tingle. How many knows what I'm talking about? What was that? It wasn't Missy. She's up on the platform. What was that? Why am I feeling that? What is going on here? Why do I want to clap my hands, Sister Sauters? That was beneath me. I didn't want to clap my hands at a church. I didn't have to do that before. Why am I going to do it now? Why, why all of a sudden is this wanting to go up? Everybody lift their hands, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, what am I doing? How many understands where I'm coming from? What, am I, what, what is going on here? Why is this wanting to go up? And I remember a message being taught by Brother Atkins. The sign of obedience was just simply giving myself and lifting my hands and just being obedient to the word of the Lord and to the move of God. And all the next thing you know, my, when my hands went up, that was the beginning of the end, Brother Johnston. As soon as you get your hands up and you're able to lift your hands in church, it's over. Because now you've done, it, you've done submitted to him. You've done shown not only, it doesn't matter who's around you, but you've done, you done you done shown yourself and shown God that I'm submitting to you, God. I'm opening up now. My vessel's becoming open now. 
And this vessel I thought was full, whatever I had, I guess it was a pride and it was whatever. This vessel, when I opened up my hand, when I lift my hands and I opened it up, everything that was bad, everything that was that wasn't of God started to pour out, and something else started to start filling it up. Amen. I opened myself up, I turned, I opened the cap, I threw it off. And all that prideness and all that everything just started coming out. Empty and how. And the word of the Lord started filling it up. Your worship started filling it up. The move of the Holy Ghost started filling it up. That's what I felt. What was that? It's not a coincidence. You cannot explain to me how any average person can come into an apostolic church and stand in the presence of the Lord and not feel something. Because even if you say you don't, you're lying to yourself, you're lying to your family, and you're lying to God. There's no human being on the face of this earth that can be in the Holy Ghost atmosphere and not feel something. I've seen it too many times. I've seen witches. I've seen witches cry in the corner. Beckwith, 1990. I've seen a witch cry in the corner of the foyer. I've, I've seen a deaf and mute man begin to speak in tongues in the same service. The same service that had a witch crying in the corner had a, had a man that could not speak a word other than dolphin noises because he was deaf and mute and he began to speak in tongues. Now you explain that to me. That was really early on for me. So when we come in here today and we, and we say, let's worship the Lord, if you don't feel like it at that moment, you got to think about everything else. you got to think about the people around you. you got to think about your family that's home that should be here. Amen? Amen? So no matter what you feel like doing, it's not up to you sometimes. You're required. You're required by the blood that runs through your veins to give it to God, to give it to Him. So I'm just going to ask you one more time. Let's all stand. I've told you I don't have, this is just announcements. I don't have anything that tells me what we got to do here. But I just feel that if you're able to stand, and if you can't stand, I just want you to lift your hands. I want you from the bottom of your heart today, right now, I want you to touch God. And when I say touch God, I want you to jump up there and grab a hold of him. Grab a hold of him right now. And let's ask the Lord to continue to move in this service. Let's ask the Lord to bless us with his word. Let's ask the Lord to anoint us with the Holy Ghost in power like we've never had before because he's able and he is just and he will do it. Hallelujah. Let's everybody. What would happen if everybody right now was a part of this? What would happen in this sanctuary if everybody would lift their hands and everybody would, <coughs> would open their heart? Everybody reach out to touch him. Reach out to touch him. Hallelujah, hallelujah. When they marched around Jericho, everybody marched. When they blew the trumpets, everybody blew. 
When they prayed in the upper room, everybody prayed. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise you, God. I praise you, God. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Come on. Let's submit to him right now. Let's submit to the Holy Ghost. Let's submit to what God is doing in this house. Hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, you feel what I'm feeling. I can see it on your faces. It's in the atmosphere right now. There's a move of God in the atmosphere right now. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Yeah, hallelujah. Oh, I will give you all. Oh, that's I'll it. Everything, give everything. You all. If all is what you ask of me, I will not withhold. Yeah, and no, 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 very best to you God to you God hallelujah Jesus thank you Jesus oh come on that's it that's it hallelujah I can't stop this I can't stop this
anyone else wants prayed for, would you come right now? Anyone else wants to be anointed and prayed for, would you come? No, 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 no. Sister Crystal. Reach your hands towards Sister Crystal right now.
One more time with a shout of praise. One more time unto the Lord God Almighty. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My, my. What a powerful atmosphere. Not just of the Holy Ghost, but an atmosphere of faith. There's faith in this place. There's faith in here today. Hallelujah. I believe in doctors. I go to doctors. I've had surgeries. We've got health professionals that are members of our church here today. But I also know that there's a healer in heaven. I also know that God still does miracles. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Before we move on, let's pray over the prayer list that's on the prayer request sheet. Uh, we want to pray for Sister Deb Jeffers. Sister Deb fell yesterday, so let's pray for her. God would touch her. I spoke with Sister Alice and Brother Clarence this morning. Both are in a lot of pain, uh, so let's pray for them. Ask God to touch them. Continue to pray for Betty. I think she's doing some better, right? And she says that's because we're praying. And so let's keep praying for Betty. I, I tell you, I love those two people. I love them dearly. And I would sure love to see them get the Holy Ghost. I'd sure love to see God fill them both with the Holy Ghost. They're good, good people. All right, and let's pray for them. And there's many other names on the prayer list today. A lot of names under unspoken names. But also the, the list is full today of folks that need salvation. So let's pray, God, in your precious name. I pray, God, right now as we have been in this move of the Spirit, this move of the Holy Ghost, this atmosphere of faith that is in this house right now, God, we believe you, Lord. And, God, we pray over every name for healing. God, by your stripes, we claim healing right now in the name of Jesus. Lord God, you're able by the power of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, God, because you can. You're able, Holy Ghost. You're able, God, to do the miraculous. Raise them up, Lord, with healing power and virtue. Touch the lost God with conviction and calls them, Lord. Bring them to the altar. Whatever it takes for them to be saved, God, we pray. Whatever it takes, touch every unspoken need tonight, today, God. In Jesus' name, order this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody shout amen. 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 You may be seated. My, what a great, great atmosphere. What a tremendous exhortation by Brother Kevin. And he almost, almost started walking all over my, my sermon today. 
I just have one question. What do you mean like a 25-year-old? I guess facts are facts, right? You can't change your age and you can't change your gender. You are what you are. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. I can identify with a 25-year-old, but I still got a 62-year-old body. Amen. Amen. Sister Pam, would you take these prayer requests and pray over them? Amen. Thank you, Brother Stephen. Remember to pray for uh, Brother Massey Sr., uh, Sister Pam, Brother Tom's dad. Remember to pray for him. He is in need of a touch of God. And so remember and ask God to touch him and pray for him. Normally, of course, we take the offering at this time, but we're still doing our offering back here at the door. I want to remind you that offering is not just something we do. Offering is worship. It's just as much worship as what you have done for the past 30 minutes. It's just as much worship what we do every time we start a service. Offering is your worship unto God. Your tithing, your offering, what you give, you give as worship unto the Lord. So when we take offering, that's not a change in an order of the service. That's just worship service. That's just worship service. That's what we do. We worship God in our giving. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Sister Kinsey, would you come? We've asked Sister Kinsey to sign today. Let's keep worshiping. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, we praise you, Jesus. Lord, we praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I don't know how many times I've watched Kenzie do that. Every single time. It stirs me. Every single time it reaches down and causes something inside of me just to, just to worship him, just to want to worship him, to praise him for what God has done. God has set today a tremendous stage for the message that I'm going to bring to you I don't know if this is more preaching or teaching. Maybe it's a little bit of preaching, a whole lot of teaching. But I want to speak to you for the next few moments on this is what worship looks like. This is what worship looks like. You know, sometimes you need to take a second look at things. I remember reading the story, Brother Nick, you'll appreciate this. A new father was standing by the crib of his newborn baby. This is, was their first baby. And the mother just kind of stood at the door for a moment. She watched him as he gazed down into that crib where that baby was laying. And she noticed his face was just filled with amazement and delight, maybe a little bit of disbelief and and just deep emotions that were, were displayed on his face. And so she walked up to him and she put her arm around him and she said, a penny for your thoughts. And he stood there silent for a moment and he said, it's just absolutely amazing. I just can't see how anybody can make a crib like that for only forty six fifty.
Sometimes you got to take a second look at things. Stand with me, Mark chapter 14. <clears throat> you probably know where I'm going today. Mark chapter 14, and what I preach today, I preach out of obedience to the word of God. For Jesus was so impressed with what happened that he said, wheresoever the gospel is preached, this has to be told as a memorial to her. He was so moved by what happened that day. He said, this has got to be told everywhere. So in obedience to the scripture, we go to Mark chapter 14 and verse 3. And being in Bethany in the house, Simon the leper, some believe that this was a leper that Jesus had healed. If that is so, then he owed the Lord a lot. As he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment, of spikenard, very precious. She broke the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. They murmured against her. Jesus said, let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me, for ye have the poor with you always. And whensoever ye will, ye may do them good. But me ye have not always. She hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. And verily or truly I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. Now understand, this is only two days before Passover. Two days before Jesus is betrayed. Two days before he is to be tried and sentenced to death. Two days. And she came and did this. One more scripture, and they do not have this in the back. I'm just going to read it to you real quick. One verse from Revelation the 11th chapter. Bible says, but the court, I'm sorry, verse 1. I was reading verse 2. Verse 1, little chapter 11, verse 1. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure. And he told him to measure three things. Measure the temple of God. Measure the altar. And them that worship measure three things the temple measure the altar and measure the worshipers i want to preach to you for a few moments this is what worship looks like lord jesus we thank you for god we have been moved today we have stood in the presence of Almighty God. We have felt you moving in this place. And I believe today prayers have been answered. I pray, pray today, God, in this part of the service, that, Lord, let your holy anointing be upon me as a servant of the Lord, that I may deliver the word to this precious congregation that you have given me today, and that, God, this word will go forth as precious seed, that it will fall upon tender hearts. I pray it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, you may be seated. I know the time, and I'm up here probably a little later than I normally would be, so I will try my best 
to be very aware of that. It's been several years since I preached my first message, Stephen. It's been a while. I wasn't 25. I was even older than that when I preached it at North Charleston. There were two preachers that night. I was the first one because I was the younger one. The other man had been in church, I believe, all of his life. It was Brad Liston. And he was going to preach following me. And I realized that that was not a competition between he and I. We were not, we were not competing as to be, to be the best preacher that night. But I didn't want to look dumb either. And so my first message came from the prophet Jeremiah. Probably not where most people would expect the first message of a young preacher to come from, but that's where I went to. Jeremiah, the 18th chapter, you'll know the scripture. Arise, go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. And so he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. That was the first message that I preached as a young man with a calling upon his life, a new calling. Just started feeling the call of God, Sister Charlotte. I just started feeling God beginning to direct me and feel that God's hand was upon my life. And I preached that message, and that message voiced the desire that was burning in my heart. And quite honestly, that same desire continues to burn within me. My desire was then and will always be, mold me. God, let me be clay in your hands and mold me. Let me be what you want me to be, God, mold me. And in the molding process over the years, I've learned that there are some non-negotiable things that we have to hold to. I've learned there's some things that are not for sale in the kingdom of God. There are some things that we've got to believe and we've got to hold on to that we cannot allow to, to become watered down or compromised as the world tries to water down the gospel. As the world tries to water down our faith, the first thing I understand that is non-negotiable is we've got to understand that sin is still sin, that we are born in sin and shaped in, in iniquity, and sin is a cancer of the soul. I understand that it still takes the blood of Jesus to cleanse a sin-sick soul. We can't ever compromise on the blood. Don't stop singing about the blood. Don't stop preaching the blood. Don't stop pleading the blood of Jesus. We've got to have the blood of Jesus. We can't compromise the blood. One of the other things that is not for sale is the truth that Jesus is God. He is the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And the Word was made flesh. Jesus is God. We can't compromise repentance and leading a repented lifestyle. We can't compromise baptism in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. And we cannot compromise that we must be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We must be born of water and of spirit to enter the kingdom of heaven. Another thing we cannot compromise is our holiness. We cannot compromise holiness. We cannot compromise holiness. Our holiness, our separation marks us. Our holiness and our separation protects us. It is a fence about us. It protects our homes. It protects our marriages. It protects our peace of mind. It protects our health. Holiness, we can't compromise holiness. Amen. But there's another thing that we've got to hold on to. 
And there's another thing that is non-negotiable, and that is our worship. That is our worship. Worship is non-negotiable. Worship is not a spectator sport. Worship is not something we do for entertainment. Worship is not Sunday 11 to 11.30 while Sister Missy is on the keyboard. Worship goes much deeper and much farther than that. And we must never compromise our worship. 111 times. Let me tell you something. Worship is important to God. Your worship is important to God. It is non-negotiable. 111 times the word worship appears in 105 verses in the word of God. Noah, after he had built the ark, after he had taken his family on the ark and survived the flood that destroyed most of humanity, walked off of the ark. Noah didn't go build a house. Noah built an altar, and Noah worshiped. The first thing he did when he got off the ark, he said, I've got to worship God. Abram walked with his son up that hill and he worshiped when he laid his only son on an altar as God had commanded him. And worship is so important to God that the, the Lord, when he was making covenant with his people, he said, for thou shalt worship no other God. Worship is important to God. Your worship Worship is so important to God that the Bible said he seeks people to worship him. He is looking for worshipers. He is seeking out men and women that will truly and honestly worship him in spirit and in truth. And worship is so important to God that the revelation, the revelation tells us that worshipers are measured. He looks at worshipers. He puts worship along beside the altar. He puts worship beside the temple of God. He said, I'm going to measure the temple. I'm going to see what the temple looks like. I'm going to see how your altar is. How's your prayer life? And I want to see how your worship is. Is your worship what I want it to be? We need to understand what worship looks like. One of the most beautiful pictures of worship found in the Bible I read to you from Mark chapter 14, and that is of a lady named Mary. Jesus sitting in the house of Lyman, Simon the leper. And some feel, as I've said, that he was a leper that Jesus had healed. Let me tell you something. I feel a great debt to God today for who I am. I feel a great debt for who I am and what God has made me to be because I was not this man when I came to him. It's hard to tell. I would probably be somewhere on the roadside drunk. I would probably be in a pit or in a ditch somewhere. I may not even be alive today had it not been for Jesus Christ, had it not been for the power of Almighty God. I owe him a debt. And I'm sure Simon felt the same way. I'm sure he understood that there was much that he owed Jesus. Now, I know what it's like when Christmas is coming up or a special event at the Johnston house and when company's coming because it is all hands on deck. It is everybody cleaning everywhere. We're making sure that everything looks good. We're going to make sure the kitchen's cleaned up. That's usually Kenzie's job. She, we're going to make sure the, the sweepers run and the floor is swept and the furniture's dusted. We're going to make sure that dinner's cooked just right. We're going we're to make sure that everything's good when company's coming. Well, Simon had Jesus coming. He had the miracle worker coming. And he had the great teacher coming. So I'm sure Simon went to extreme lengths and to great expense to make sure that his house was exactly the way he needed to be. And as they sat down to this 
perfectly planned supper as they sat down to fellowship and as they sat down to enjoy the dinner that Simon and his servants had prepared in walks a lady. She just walks into Simon's house. There seems to be no knock at the door. There seems to be no, no stopping to say, may I come in? She just shows up. She just comes in and she walks over. Luke said that when she came to the feet of Jesus that she was weeping. Let me tell you something. Worship digs deep down in your spirit. When it's true worship, worship is not superficial. It's not on the outside. Worship comes from the depths of our heart. She was overcome with great emotion. She was overcome as she stood there and could not speak. All she could do was weep when she stood there. And she takes that box, that box of precious ointment, and the Bible says she breaks that box. And that ointment begins to spill out of that box. And she begins to anoint the feet of Jesus that box and pours it out upon him. Worship. This is what worship looks like. She came. The first thing that worship looks like is worship is prepared. She didn't wait for the first key to be hit on the keyboard to say, I'm going to worship God. She didn't wait for the first song to take place for her to worship God. She didn't wait for her favorite chorus to be sung to say, I'm going to worship God. She didn't wait for the favorite preacher to show up to say, I'm going to worship God. She had already picked that box out at home. She had got that box before she left the house. Sister Teresa, she had that box and she knew what she was going to do before she got there. She was going to worship God. We can't wait till we get to church to say, oh, I'm going to worship God today. If you're waiting... If you're waiting for your favorite song to worship, your worship's not internal, it's, ex it's external. It depends on something external. It depends on something on the outside to influence your worship. But if your worship is from the heart, if your worship is down from down deep inside of you, conditions or not, song or not, music or not, preacher or not, somebody watching or not, it doesn't matter. You go, you're going to worship God. It's going to come out. It's going to show. People are going to see. You're going to worship God. Your worship is born not out of the beat of the music and not out of the, even the words or the tenor of the song. Now, I've got songs that move me. I've got songs that touch me. They touch me. They touch my heart. They stir something on the inside of me. But I don't have to wait for that song to come up for me to worship God. I don't have to wait for another singer for me to worship God. My worship is not about who's singing or what song's being sung. My worship is about him. Your worship is all about him. True worship, true worship is birth before you ever get here. True worship comes from a prayer room. When God gave Moses the design for the tabernacle, he said, here's how I want you to set it up. I want you to put that huge brazen altar at the entrance. I want you to put that labor of water next before you go into the holy place. But then I want you to cover the holy place and the holy of holies with badger skins and all these, all these things, he said. He said, I want, I want you to cover it. It's not going to always look pretty. It's not going to always look nice from the outside. But when you get on the inside, I want you to the left, I want you to place that golden candlestick. And to the right, I want you to place that table of showbread. But then right before the holy of holies, I want you to put another altar. 
You've already got one altar outside, the altar of repentance, the altar of blood, the altar of sacrifice. I want that altar before they ever come into my presence. I want that altar before they ever step inside the holy place because when they step into the holy place, they shut out everything else. There are no windows to see the world and there's no windows for the world to see in. There are There, there is no, no distraction from what's going on outside because when you're in that holy place that is a place of communion with God that is a place where you labor and you work and you do what you are called to do and you are placed in that in that place of communion and shut out from everything else no distractions nothing else you go into that holy place and you you see your the light comes from the golden candlestick on the left the smell of fresh bread on the right. But then the second altar is the altar of incense. And that is your altar of worship. Do you see in God's design and in God's plan, your worship, your, you just can't go from point A to point worship. You cannot just go from, from that. You have, you have to have been at the brazen altar and you have to have been at the laver and you have to have been to the candlestick and you have to have been to the table because you can't get to worship until... <coughs> Until you have made your way past those other things, worship is is birthed out of a relationship with God. Worship is birthed out of time spent at an altar. Worship is birthed. It comes not because of the music, not because of this or that. It comes because you've got something on the inside of you that God, that God has placed. God didn't place the altar of incense by a bloody brazen altar. He didn't place it by the labor where you look in and you examine yourself. He didn't place it first before the candlestick where you have to have revelation. He didn't place it before the table where God sustains you and God strengthens you. He placed it after all of that. And when you get to that place, shutting out the world and shutting out the influences of the world and shutting out all the stuff that tries to get your attention and all the things that your flesh tries to rise up and bring about in you... When you get past that, then you can worship God. Then you can worship God. (laughs) Worship comes from our relationship with God. So worship is first prepared. Worship is prepared. I've known some great worshipers in my day. I've seen some tremendous worshipers. We've had tremendous worshipers in this church who have paid the price at the, at the brazen altar. And they've, they've washed themselves at the laver. And they've received from the table. And they, they, they've heard, heard from God at the candle. And they know how to worship God. They know how to worship him. They know how to praise him. I've seen him, and they come prepared. They walk through the door of the church. Brother Kevin doesn't have to get up here, and Brother Kevin doesn't have to say, oh, let somebody please worship God. Please, somebody praise him today. So somebody doesn't have to get up here and say, oh, uh, folks, I know you're tired, but, but really God does, God's worthy, so let's, could we do a little bit? No, it doesn't require begging. It doesn't require pleading. It doesn't require pumping us up. Worship comes. Worship comes out of something you've already got before you got here. Worship is prepared. She had that box before she walked into the house. Worship is prepared. The second thing that worship looks like is sacrifice. Worship looks like sacrifice. Let me tell you something. Mary didn't stop at Walgreens and get a bottle of aqua velva. (laughs) 
she didn't try to figure out Aqua Velva Old Spice. <laughs> Mary went to something that was in her house that was precious. She found something. Maybe this was an heirloom that had been passed from generation to generation. I don't know. I don't know. <coughs> but this was something that Mary had. And she got out that alabaster box of perfume. And according to estimates, this precious box of ointment may have been worth up to 300 denarii. And if you consider back then that the average day's wage was one denarii, that's almost a year's wages, Brother Tom, for what she brought. She brought 300 days worth of labor in that box. Something precious. She didn't give Jesus the leftovers. She gave him the best. Oh, you need to hear that right now. She gave him the best. She didn't give him the leftovers. She didn't give him what, what would just get her by. She gave him the best. No one would have said anything if she had just walked in and said, Jesus, thank you for delivering me. Nobody would have, would have said anything if she had come in and said, Jesus, uh, yeah, I, I want to be a follower and I want to be a disciple. I want to go with you. And you're, 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 you're worthy of my praise. Nobody would have said anything. But that wasn't enough for Mary. Mary said, I've got to have something that's worth something. i got to have something that's costly. i got to have something that is sacrificial. I've got to give him my best. <laughs> Told you, Brother Kevin was walking all over my message. He was walking all over it. Let me tell you something, young people. She didn't give him the energy left over after she stayed up all night playing video games. Oh, boy, I felt that. <laughs> she didn't give him the energy left after she stayed up all night watching TV. Hello? We walked through the door. And, How are you? Well, oh, I'm tired, man. I was up half the night. Well, did you win? No. Come in church and plop down. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Lord, you better be glad I'm here. I'm tarred. <laughs> no. She said, I can't give him what's left over. I can't give him something that, that, that doesn't cost me anything. She said, I can't hold anything back. I've got to give him the best. I've got to find something in my house that's of value. i got to find something in this place that I can give him. i got to find something that costs me something. And she brought everything she had of value and importance to her, and she laid it at the feet of Jesus Christ. She gave it because she loved him. She gave it because it cost her something something this wasn't the first time worship cost everything as a matter of fact can anybody tell me when the first time the word worship appears in the bible anybody real quick i'm not gonna if you know shout it out if you're not that's fine genesis chapter 22 genesis chapter 22 is the first time worship. As a matter of fact, it's the first time love appears in the Bible, and they appear together. In Genesis chapter 22, God has spoken to Abraham just a few years before, and he has promised him a son. He said, I'm going to give you a son. And this chapter begins, after these things, God did tempt Abraham Take now thy son. That's the one God promised him. Thine only son. And offer him for a burnt offering 
upon the mountain that I will tell you. Oh, Brother Johnston, that seems, that doesn't seem like God. God's telling him to take his son to a, and offer his son as a burnt offering. If Abraham was like me, he would have taken a little longer to pack his suitcases that day. He'd have taken a little longer to make the journey to Mount Moriah. He would have taken a little longer to put one foot in front of the other, navigating the rough terrain of going up that mountain because he knew at the top of the mountain that Isaac, who was beside him, Isaac carrying the wood to build the altar that they would lay him on. He knew when he got up there, God had already told him what he required of him. God had already told him, you've got to give the thing you love the most. Give the thing you love the most. Do you know what Abraham, Abraham said to his servants? Stay here. The lad and I are going yonder to worship. Worship looks like sacrifice. Worship costs you something. Worship is not superficial. Worship, true worship, is not something that's drummed up by the music. See, Abraham was about to show a church in Ravenswood, West Virginia, what worship looks like. And it looks like sacrifice. And Isaac built his altar. Where's the sacrifice, Dad? Isaac, would you lay down on that altar, son? Would you lay down on that altar? Because Isaac, God has asked me to give the thing I love the most. And I'm here to worship. Isaac, Abram may have walked a little slower, but he went without question. He went without question. Isaac, God has asked me to give everything. And Isaac, you're the sacrifice. Well, you know the story. As Abraham lifted the knife in the air, had that knife hovering over his son, ready to bring that knife down, all of a sudden he heard a noise in the thicket. And God provided a sacrifice. There's so much revelation in that, I don't even have time, time to preach it. Just understand that worship looks like sacrifice. Worship looks like being prepared. And worship looks like sacrifice. Oh God, give us the passion of Mary. And God, give us the obedience of Abraham that we can worship you. Give us God so that we can truly be a worshiper in spirit and in truth. The Bible says we bring a sacrifice of praise unto the Lord. What do you mean, Brother Johnston? I mean we worship when we don't feel like it. We worship when it takes every strength in our body to raise our hands. We worship. We worship when we're, God, when we're standing against the biggest giant we've ever seen. We worship. When we're going through the darkest valley we've ever walked through, we worship. When we don't understand what we're going through, we worship. We worship because we're willing, no matter what, to give what we love. We worship in our tithing and giving our 10% to God. We worship. We don't hold anything back. We don't hold anything back for ourselves. We give to God what belongs to God. We worship in our offering because God has blessed us beyond measure. We worship. And when we surrender to the Lord and we surrender our lives to God, that 
is an act of worship. When we say God, Kevin said, when I lifted my hands, I knew I had surrendered. That's worship. That's worship when you surrender to God and you say, God, not my will, but thy will. That's worship. <laughs> worship looks like being prepared. And worship looks like sacrifice. And worship comes without Distraction. She came, Mary did, when she walked in that place. She came to see one person. One person. And that was Jesus. She didn't come to look at the house. She didn't come to see how clean it was. She didn't come to see Simon. She didn't come to see Peter. She didn't come to see John or anybody else. She came with one thing on her mind, and that's Jesus. She wasn't deterred by criticism. Don't you hate critical people? Oh, they started criticizing. She was worshiping, and they criticized her. Now, there's a lot of speculation because all four Gospels record an event of when somebody came and broke an alabaster box and poured it on Jesus. And there's, there's all kinds of which Mary is it and all this kind of thing. And, but the one, the one that's recorded in Luke says of the woman that came in that she was a sinner. Let me tell you something. Don't ever look across the aisle. Be careful how you judge somebody's worship. You better be careful because you may become like David's wife who stood up in the tower and watched David as he danced before the Lord and criticized him because he was dancing before the Lord and God made her barren. He removed the blessing of childbirth from her life. Because she judged a worshiper. You better be careful. You better be careful. This woman didn't come to hear her favorite preacher. Or she didn't stay home because her favorite preacher wasn't there. She came to worship. Oh, God, give us worshipers. Give us true worshipers who worship him in spirit and in truth. She came. She didn't worry what they were saying. She broke the box. She didn't worry with people pointing fingers at her. She broke the box. She didn't count to see how many people were in the house. She broke the box. She didn't look to see if somebody was watching her so they could be impressed with what she did. She broke the box for one, and that was for Jesus. Worship is without distraction. Worship doesn't care what everybody else is doing. I'm a worshiper, and God, I've come to worship you. The fourth thing, the fourth thing that worship is, is worship is love. How long has it been since we just came to the house to worship Jesus? How long has it been when we just came to worship him? Three times, three times Mary appears front and center in the Gospels. And are you aware that each time Mary appears, she's at the feet of Jesus? Each time. The first time she appears, Martha's in the kitchen serving. And Mary's at the feet of Jesus. The second time she appears is Lazarus has died and Jesus is coming to the tomb and Mary runs to him and falls at his feet, the Bible says. And the third time is Mary kneeling, breaking the alabaster box of ointment. The first time, She's sitting, learning at the feet of Jesus. She wants to hear 
the word of God. The second time she is leaning, she comes and she throws herself at the feet of Jesus and she's leaning on her faith and the power of God. And the third time that Mary appears, she is kneeling at the feet of Jesus because she is loving. The first time she's learning, the second time she's leaning, and the third time, she's loving. One of these days, I'll preach my message, Three Steps to Extravagance, about Mary. Someday. But my friend, this is what worship looks like. It looks like coming ready and prepared, not needing pumped up, not needing someone to try to beg you to worship comes a sacrifice. I'll worship when it don't make sense. I'll worship. The third is coming without distraction. I'm not here to impress anybody. I'm not here to see what anybody thinks about me. I'm not here to see what, I, what you're doing. I'm here for him. And the fourth thing that worship looks like is love. And it comes out of an intimacy. Mary broke that box. Mary poured, poured the ointment. And the Bible says that the house was filled with the odor of that ointment. Everyone was there, became a part of Mary's worship experience. Everybody that was there was touched by Mary's worship. I love being around people that worship because it rubs off on you. True worshipers, they rub off on you. They affect you. And Mary's worship affected everybody in the room. And there was no denying, there was no denying that she was prepared. There was no denying that she came sacrificing. There was no denying that she was there for an audience of one, and there was no denying that she loved and honored Jesus. You know the funny thing about it? Even those that criticized her was blessed by the fragrance that was in that room. And I would say it wasn't long before the fragrance that was in that room drifted outside to those who were around the house and they could smell what's going on. You see, when God is truly worshiped in spirit and in truth, you can't keep it quiet. When God is truly worshiped in spirit and in truth, you can't hide it. And the fragrance of our worship will fill this room, will fill this town, will fill this county, there's no gift too excessive, and there's no sacrifice too great. So let me ask you, does your worship look like Mary's? Does your worship look like Mary's worship? Stand with me. Folks, too many people come just for the fishes and the loaves. Too many people come just for the blessings. What would happen if we walked through the door and rather than saying, you know what, I've come to get my blessing today, I wonder what would happen if we say, God, I'm just here to worship you. I'm just here to worship you. Because when God is worshiped, When God is worshiped, the glory of God will fill the house. God's looking for worshipers. God is measuring worshipers. This is what worship looks like. I want us to take the few, next few minutes 
Sister Missy, let's, let's just go without music for a minute. And you can go, we'll, we'll start it back up here in a minute. But this isn't about the music. It's not about the beat of the drum. It's about worship. It's about who he is. Why don't we just for the next little bit, let's just turn this in this service with a worship service. Let's just end it right now. Coming to worship God. Coming to worship. Oh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.